wanted to bring in somebody that could um, provide some inspiration, provide that energy. Um, and so when we were all kind of sitting around as a concept team, Crystal uh, shouted out, I think Luke is the best person. And I had not had the chance to meet Luke at that time, but the way she described him seemed perfect. And then since meeting him, knowing that he gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning and has already had a workout and three cups of espresso, he is the man yes, yes, yes. to start us this morning. So uh, Luke Gustafson is the Vice President of Retail Operations for Berkshire Brothers. He oversees more than 6,000 employees and 117 stores across Texas and Louisiana. So please give a round of applause. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for allowing me to be here with you. Thank you all for taking time after your day to be here. It's going to be a very fun day. There's a lot, a huge lineup, a six session lineup of speakers. Um, as, as Tara had mentioned, you know, it's been a very interesting year, it's been a very challenging year, it's been an unprecedented year, uh, like one we've never seen before. And um, one of the things that we've learned uh, as a company and as individuals is during unprecedented times, you have to come up with unprecedented solutions. You have to come up with things um, that we typically may not do, unorthodox ways to connect with each other. Uh, everyone's wearing masks. I think the communication is not what it is. The nonverbal communication, you can't see if they're smiling or if they're angry, if they're sticking their tongue out at you. You don't know what's going on behind the mask. So it's definitely um, challenging times, but I think, you know, the way you respond to that and, and the way uh, you deal with that and, the, and, and how the actions that you take as a result of that really makes the difference of uh, the success that you're going to have. So um, several things we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk to you today about protecting the brand and why it is so important to protect the brand and why it is so, why marketing is important in general and some of the things that you're going to hear about today that's going to help you uh, improve your business. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do first is I'd like to compliment the Chamber of Commerce. That's a huge uh, accomplishment that this Chamber has. Uh, we're very fortunate to live in a community where the chamber as strong as it is that supports the community nonprofits that can work support the community businesses and that puts networking opportunities learning opportunities and in, in, in education opportunities like this together so a uh, big shout out to the chamber i've had the opportunity to live in a lot of different areas transferring from store to store with virtual brothers over the last 25 years and I will tell you, Lufkin, Angelina County Chamber of Commerce is one of the strongest that I've seen. So uh, kudos to them for what they do. The mission, I think it's important to know the mission of the chamber. Um, the mission is to advocate and improve economic prosperity um, and the business environment in our community. And I think that's very, very important to have that prosperity and growth and advancement in a community and that we all come together to make sure that we accomplish that. Uh, I feel like communities can accomplish great things when everybody's working together um, to accomplish a common goal. So, um, also, one thing I would like to say also, Trey, I didn't know that you were the presenting sponsor, so I'll invoice you <laughs> and appreciate that, Trey. Yeah. Um, thank y'all for being the presenting sponsor here. Um, I'd like to start off by telling you a little about me and what makes me tick and and, um, and kind of the things, the, the way I look at life and um, in general. And so I started out with Brookshire Brothers in Kirbyville, Texas when I was 16 years old as a bagger. It's my very first job. I went to work at 16. Um, I grew up in a family that um, they, my parents both worked hard, but um, uh, they didn't get educated until later on in life. So um, we didn't have a whole lot. So if I, at 16, I had to go to work because I wanted a truck and, um, and I wanted to be able to help out with household bills. So I went to work as a bagger, and my first paycheck with Brookshire Brothers is the first $100 bill that I had ever seen. And um, at that point, I was hooked. Um, I, I, that was more money than I've ever seen at one time in my life. And uh, later on, and, and you know, we have some store directors here. Um, we have Wyman uh, Park. We ran stores for Brookshire Brothers for a long time. So um, one day, the store director asked me to go make a deposit with him, go to the bank with him. So I went to the bank with him, and we made the store deposit, and it was payday, so he pulled out his check. He cashes his check, I pull out my little check, I cash my check, and they counted, you know, they counted some hundred dollar bills out. And I looked at him and said, what's that? And he said, that's, uh, that's what I get paid each week. And I was 16 years old, and I looked at him and I said, I want to be a store director. I want to be a store manager for this company because that was more money than I've ever seen in my life. Um, and so at 16, I had a vision, and I had a goal, and I knew what I wanted to do. 
and um, I communicated it. I, I met with my boss about it. I met with the district manager about it. So when I turned 18, um, the district manager came in and um, offered me an opportunity uh, uh, to go to college, which you know I may have not had that opportunity, and to go into the management training program. So at 18, I transferred to Stephen F. Austin. Um, I went to school there, graduated with a business degree, and started running stores by the time I was about 23 years old, 22 or 23. And um, I, I was uh, one of the younger store directors. Um, I have several of them here that, that progressed early on. But I really enjoyed leading people. And I found great results, uh, great success in what I did by building teams, leading people, and treating people fairly. And so over the next 10 years, I had the opportunity to run stores. And um, in 2005, I had an opportunity to marry my college sweetheart. So uh, my college sweetheart and I got married in 2005. And um, in about nine months after we were married, um, I had a, a crotch rocket, a, a sports bike. We were involved in a very bad accident. And um, my wife was transferred uh, via helicopter life flight to Houston uh, in ICU for three months. Um, was told she wasn't going to live. They wanted to amputate her legs. And it was a very, very, very bad situation for a newlywed. We celebrated our one year anniversary in the hospital in ICU in, in Herman Memorial Hospital. And, you know, I've always been grateful and I've always had gratitude. But whenever you're having daily conversations with God and you're praying for the life of your, of your spouse, um, it gives you a different perspective. It actually puts a lot of other things in perspective. And so um, God pulled us through that, and uh, we were told that she would probably not be able to walk and that we would never have children. And so in 2011, we were blessed with our, 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 our daughter, Brees. So uh, unexpected, we didn't expect to have children. We were blessed with our daughter, Brees. That's our first born child, Gucci. Um, um, and my mom, and this is my mom older, that's the first time she had met Brees right after she was born. My mom had all boys, and I, I'm the youngest, so I was always mama's, mama's boy. And uh, when a little, little girl was born, she, she, hangs, she hangs the moon, she's the angel. So whenever things happen like that, that aren't supposed to happen, that it, it are miracles and you're blessed with, it gives you a sense of gratitude and a sense of appreciation that I think a lot of people may not have. So as a result of that, that's kind of shaped me into who I am in terms of my attitude, my appreciation, realizing um, you know, how special some of these gifts are. One of the things that um, I've done over the years, and I'm a huge student of John Maxwell, basically John Maxwell has a philosophy that if you do something very well and you do it every day, no matter what you're trying to accomplish, you can accomplish it. And he uses the analogy, if you have a tree in your yard, you're going to chop down the tree. If you go out to it, you, you hit it five times today, um, come back, hit it five times tomorrow, come back the next day, hit it five times. Eventually, what's going to happen to that tree? It's going to fall. And so it's called the rule of five. So I want to share with you my rule of five. And this is a little bit about what makes me tick is my number one rule is the golden rule. This is in life and in business. I believe in treating people the way I want to be treated. I believe in uh, being nice, being positive, being kind, being fair. I also believe in building value in others. And so I, I learned early on in a leadership position that when you start building value in people and you start helping them get what they want, they'll do everything possible to help you get what you want. Um, um, and, and, and they see that you care about them and you're trying to invest in them and build value in them. And I always say um, assets, when, when we buy a laptop, when we buy a house, when we buy a vehicle, what's the first thing that happens whenever you pay for that asset? It begins to appreciate. So the only appreciable asset that we have are people. And what I mean by that is the more you invest, the more you um, develop, the more you pour into, the more valuable that person becomes. The more valuable that person becomes, the more they're able to contribute not only to their work or to their job or to their career, but also to their family, also to those around them, also to the organizations that they're involved in. So people development, building value in others is very important to me. I love to give back, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm here visiting with you all today. To me, if one person today takes one thing that I, that I say and applies it and, and improves you in any way, that's a win for me. Um, that, that is a success for me. The number three is work hard. I believe that before anything else, people have to know you for your work. Um, and you have to be able to work hard. And, and I have a, a slide on this uh, later on when we start talking about some key components of success. 
No drama. I, I have a rule no drama. I, I can't stand drama. There's no value in it. I don't like having anything heavy on my chest or heavy on my, my shoulders. Um, it creates stress and anxiety, and it's just, I, I don't do drama. Um, and then protecting the brand, which we're going to talk to uh, in great depth today about protecting the brand. So elevate. We're here to elevate. So why are we here today? We're here to elevate our business and elevate ourselves to another level. If you would, turn the piece of paper that I set on your desk over and follow the instructions. I'm going to give you about one minute to do this before I continue. So what did we all do? We stayed in the box. We stayed in the box. No one gets out of the box. And so all we had to do is go a little further outside of the box. So today, you're going to hear some things that we are going to have to think outside the box. I said earlier, these are unprecedented times when we have to come up with unprecedented solutions, which includes getting out of the box. So the most dangerous phrase in any language is we've always done it this way. And how many of us have heard that? How many of us has heard, we've tried that and it didn't work? Um, so what we have to do in the position that we're in, and, and you all are here today because someone believes in you, you're in a position that uh, you're, you're held accountable and responsible for the marketing of the company or for growing the company or for the, some portion of the success of the company. And we have to make sure we don't get caught up and say that we've always done it this way. We have to challenge the norm. We have to step outside of the box because we're operating in, in times that we've never that we've never operated in before, and uh, we're going to have to try new things. So, one of the things I like to talk about is why are we here today? I already touched on some of this, um, but we're going to learn something new today, and you're going to learn how to be more successful not only in your business with your marketing, but you're also going to learn how to be more successful uh, personally if you apply some of the, the foundations, principles, and practices and processes that you're going to learn today. There's six outstanding speakers here. There's six very, very powerful um, sessions that you're going to learn about. And you're going to hear about certain things to elevate your marketing, to elevate your brand, and uh, to elevate yourself as well as your business. So elevate. Uh, the definition of elevate, and I, and I really like how we chose the word elevate, because to elevate means to, to bring to a more important uh, level or impressive level to enhance, exalt, or raise something to a higher level position or state. So that's what we're talking about today. That's why you're here today and that's what you're going to learn about today. So why is marketing so important? Brand awareness and, and brand loyalty. Uh, marketing helps tell a story about your product, your service, your business, your organization, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, good marketing and good branding also it, it, it really makes you activate feelings and you think about things and you think about experiences and you think about how that connects to you and, and, and your life and your story. It stimulates memories. Um, you know, think about how many brands that make you think about something and it tells a story. Um, it creates an emotional connection and human beings like having emotional connections with other human beings. And to show you how ingrained we are in that, to show you how, um, how important that is for humans, I'm gonna do a little demonstration. So I'm gonna ask you to do something, I'm gonna put a screen up, and I want you to follow what the screen says. Stop. So that was about five seconds. I didn't tell you how fast to clap, I didn't tell you what rhythm to clap in, but in five seconds, everyone in the room was clapping the same rhythm because we wanted to, to do what other people were doing. We didn't want to be the one not doing what they were doing. Marketing is very similar to that. It tries to tell a story, and the best, the best marketing is the marketing and the branding that tells the story. So storytelling is the best marketing. Um, I'm going to show you something. I want to see what this makes you feel like. Anybody recognize that brand? What does it think about? You think about hunting, you think about fishing, you think about having your cup with whatever it is you put in it. Um, <laughs> that keeps your eyes cold for hours. Um, you think about how durable and how good that product is. That is, they have done an outstanding job marketing that product. What does this make you feel like? I mean, it's a good product. They have a, they have a product that does almost exactly the same thing that Yeti does but it just gives you that feeling. 
And it's actually cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. It's about $300 for a cooler. But it does the same thing. But we don't elevate towards that. And I'll show you we don't elevate towards it. Yeti was founded in 2006. It's 14 years old, and they're almost a billion-dollar company. They're projecting a billion dollars in revenues this year. In 14 years, Igloo is 73 years old, and they're 200 million. And that's impressive. 200 million is, is huge. But they had 73 years to get there. Yeti has had 14 years to be almost a billion. The next one. Tell me what this makes you feel like. Mm. What? Mm. That's God's chicken right there. <laughs> and what does this make you feel like? There's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's, it's awesome and they're, they have impressive numbers. But there's a huge difference between the way they make us feel, the connection that we have with them, the memories that are stimulated and activated. Um, Chick-fil-A, 74 years old, founded in 1946. Annual revenues of over $11 billion. Chick-fil-A in this upcoming year is gonna be the third fast food chain in the nation um, behind McDonald's, Starbucks, then Chick-fil-A. And then 1969 and 51 years, they're at 1.6. So that's impressive. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a good company, but they haven't told the story that Chick-fil-A has told. And that doesn't make me have the same feeling of that right there. You know what's impressive, and you can go back and look at the logos, look at the marketing, look at the branding. All they have is a seat with a, that looks like a chicken. And everybody can be driving down the road and see a 100-foot pylon sign with that on it, and you're exiting because you know what it is. They don't have to say Chick-fil-A or come get the, the best chicken sandwich or whatever they have to say. The next one, just a big arch on the side of the road. You know, they don't have to say McDonald's, they don't have to say anything. How does that make you feel? What do you think about it? What do you think about the branding? I think consistency. I think go to Asia or Africa or anywhere in the world and you can go to McDonald's and get, it may not be called a quarter pounder, it may be called a royale with cheese or whatever they call it, <laughs> but you can get the same thing. They're very consistent. And how does that make you feel? Ice cream. That's a good company. They have good ice cream. They do a lot of things well, but they both started in 1940, they're both 80 years old, they had the same opportunities, the same demographics. They had everything exactly the same from the almost the exact same start time. McDonald's is at twenty-one billion dollars, and Dairy Queen's at three point six. McDonald's has almost forty thousand locations. Dairy Queen has forty-four hundred. McDonald's has told their story better. They have marketed their brand better. They have appealed to to to, to consumer much better than this brand. And I don't know what's going on with this. All I know is going to line up two hours to get this chicken. One love. It's chickens, chicken fingers. There's lines for days. And, and I, I don't know what's going on with it, but how does that make you feel? I tell you, it makes some people mad because there was almost some fights in the parking lot the other day. And after you have this, you probably need to go here. Yeah. <laughs> And I've seen those fights, they're losing their religion. You probably didn't go there. <laughs> or what I'll do, I'll get out of line and I'll go there. Yes. <laughs> those things mean something to us. We identify with things. We identify with brands. That's who we are. That's what we identify with. That's what we relate to. And you have to tell your story. You have to create that feeling. You have to be able to market that brand. Um, so a couple other ones I, I want to touch on. I think you, you see where I'm going. What's that? <laughs> so just a, a simple symbol. Everybody in the world knows that that's an electric car company. Um, they do other things, but that's Tesla. Chevy. How many of us know that? Chevy. Chevy Bolt. Chevy Bolt. You know Chevy Bolt started making electronic cars before Tesla? A year before, they started producing electronic cars before Tesla. Tesla's car, their revenues, and they do other things, and this just isn't their car revenue. $24 billion. They produce 367,000 cars. And this in 2021, they projected to produce a million, and uh, they're, they're going to hit their projections. They're going to produce a million electric cars. A million. Chevy Boat, uh, and that was 2010. That was a year later. 2011, production started on the Volt. This is impressive. $5 billion in revenues, but it's not $24 billion. Um, 157,000 cars, that's impressive. That's, that's good results, but it's not almost 400,000, and it's not going to be a million this upcoming year. MSRP is 34,000 compared to 70,000. 
and there are different characteristics between a Tesla you know, Model S and a, and a Bolt, don't, don't get me wrong, but they've told a story. And um, even though it's a good vehicle, we don't identify, if, you were just, if they were to take the, the Bolt out and just put the V, how many people would recognize what that was? So they're not to that point yet. They have not created that brand consistency and that brand loyalty yet. What about this? How that make you feel? Most of us deal with something with this every day of our life. And it has changed our life and it has changed society as a whole. What does that make you feel like? So those companies had almost the exact opportunities. At one point IBM was much, much more successful, much more um, innovative, much more um, recognized than the Apple. And you know, Apple symbols changed over the years. 275 billion, 44 years in existence, 109 billion, I mean 109 years in existence, they're currently at $77 billion. They told their story better. They told how Apple was not just a phone. Steve Jobs got up and said, this, is, this product is gonna change the way you live. It's gonna make you more productive. It's gonna make your life easier. It's going to change the way you live life. IBM did not do that. What about that? Come here, come here, remember Blackberry. Blackberry, you had to have a Blackberry. I mean, when Blackberry came out, you weren't cool if you didn't have a Blackberry. And you had the stylus, and you had the text with your stylus, and it took an hour to send one text. Um, this is a good one. What about that? We almost had fights at the office over this. Because Play Oliver, our CFO, he's not an Apple guy, he thinks Android's it. Um, so this is another way to put it. You know? um, but, but the Apple people are loyal to Apple. And the Android people are loyal to Android because they relate to that brand, they connect to that brand. There's something that that company's done that is related to those people. Or you could do that. That's what I put on his desk the other day. <laughs> he came out with this on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you know this? How many of you remember that? Yeah. You know, so. Um, I think you see where I'm going. I do want to ask, some of you may recognize it. How many recognize that? Raise your hand if you recognize that. Got one person that recognizes it. You recognize that? Yes. Same company. I that. Recognize that? Now that's all you see. <laughs> that's all they have to do. And we know when that box is there and it has that, that, that air on it, we know what it is. We, we know it's Amazon delivery. And that's marketing, guys. That's a brand. That's identifying with a brand. That's being able to innovate and, and motivate, get your word out of who you are, what you do, and how we're going to make you feel. We're going to make your life easier because you can tell Alexa to order something, it'll be there tomorrow. So, symbols that are recognized, marketing symbols, and you can go through and look at the histories of these companies. You know, Nike used to have everything that they had. You go back and look at the old logos today, you had to say it was Nike. That's just a swoosh. You target. Everybody knows that's Target, McDonald's, Apple, Starbucks. You can see that on a, on a road sign somewhere. You can see that on a hoodie. You know, a lot of guys probably don't know what that is, but girls do. <laughs> um, girls know what that is. Um, but when you get the brand recognition, where you can just put a symbol up and everybody in the world knows who you are, and when you look at those things, a lot of them, you have an emotional connection. You have an experience. You have a story to tell with that. So there's brands, and this is some of the most popular, most recognized brands, and now the digital brands. So starting to see more digital. You're starting to see the applications, and, and we're getting away from the old logos and the old marketing. What you're going to hear today is the impact of digital and social marketing on business, nonprofits, personal business, um, and uh, throughout. So I mean, most of you probably have a lot of these on your on your screensaver, on your desktop, on your phone. 75% of marketers report positive results and increased traffic from social media. 93 of marketers use social media for business, and they say that uh, it's over 1.1 trillion annually is in, in sales and revenues influenced by webs. 81% of the customers get advice from social networks, and you'll hear, you know, you'll hear them talk about that today because it's it's only growing, especially with the pandemic, especially with people being a little more uh, cognizant of being safe and, and not being out in public as much. What happened with these companies? Failure to innovate, bankruptcy, chapter 11. They didn't tell their story. They didn't connect with the consumers. They failed to innovate, they failed to evolve, they failed to adapt, and most of them went away. 
So a couple examples, the old shotgun approach, you got here traditional advertising, print, um, advertising, television, and nothing against it. Some of that's still very effective, and I know, you know, there's a place for it. But the old shotgun approach to where you put a bullet in the chamber, you pull the trigger, and it, it spreads out, and you try to hit somebody. You're hoping to hit somebody. Sometimes you hit them, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you hit miss your target, sometimes you don't know what your target is. Um, digital advertising. Using analytics and using customer data to be able to specifically target customers that like you, that love you, that buy your product, that shop at your stores, that that sponsor, that that um, support your nonprofits. That's where we're going. We're going to a sniper approach of knowing exactly who that customer is. Trey and I were visiting uh, a while back. Trey McWilliams and I. And we were talking about a lawsuit that was opened up against Target. And I don't remember all the details, so don't quote me on it, but basically what happens is, is they're using digital monetization, they can track credit card purchases and know the behaviors of customers through all these algorithms that tell you, okay, customers that buy this, this, and this must be dealing with this, right? And so there was a college student, she was using her parents' credit cards, she was shopping at Target, I guess she had a pinwheel app or whatever it was, and her parents was, was getting mail and they started getting targeted for diapers, newborn diapers and uh, infant formula, and so they were you know, curious, they were calling the office like, hey, why are we getting these things? And two months later, they found out their daughter was pregnant. Target knew their daughter was pregnant before she knew she was pregnant. And that's the technology that's out there. And, and that's only evolving. I mean, that was, that, was a couple years, that was a couple months ago or a year ago. And we're so much more advanced now from being able to track that consumer and know what they're buying and know what they're, they're gearing towards. Uh, once again, same thing here. A, you just shoot all your errors, and, and these errors are expensive or you want to save money and you want to target exactly who appeals to your market. The world's full of brands. How are you gonna differentiate? How are you gonna make your brand stand out? What are you gonna to do to make sure that those customers understand your story? And that's what you're gonna hear about today. What is your story? So, one thing I wanna talk about, and, and this is an interesting part of the presentation for me, I wanna talk about you. You're your brand. We're talking about protecting the brain. Um, that was Amazon symbol in the 90s. That was Bezo in 98. <laughs> that's Amazon today, that's the richest man in the world right now. That's him in 2017. Did he evolve with his brand or did he devolve? Yeah, money can do a lot, I get it, yeah. <laughs> but, but he is his brand. And there are some people that when you see them, you recognize them because that's their brand. And they represent their brand, just like I represent my brand, just like you represent your brand. Uh, when we, people see us out in town, they, they connect you with uh, Keller Williams. They connect, connect you with Dan Mepper. They connect you with BitLife. They connect you with Merrill Lynch um, because that's your brand. They, Edward Jones, they connect you with Edward Jones, nature's eye. So um, that's our brand. What's he connected to? Was connected to? His family's still connected. Apple, Steve Jobs. Y'all recognize that young man? What about that man? So you see them out anywhere, you automatically think Tesla, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. The best projects that you'll ever work on in, in your business, in your life, is you. That is the best project you'll ever work on. So let's talk about you for a minute. <clears throat> so there are several things, and I'm going to share with you today um, several things. I'm going to speak to, to you from the heart. I'm going to speak to you from the gut. I'm going to talk to you about processes that have served me well, things that have worked very well for me. I'm very, very fortunate. I'm very, very blessed in so many ways. Uh, the first way, um, you know, I, I think through my faith, I've been blessed greatly. And also, I'm blessed with the people in my inner circle. I am surrounded with some of the most solid people um, in my inner circle that hold me accountable, that love me, that champion me, that care about me, and that pick me up anytime I start dipping down at all. Um, I'm a, they hold me accountable, they're honest with me, and I think that that is so, so important. And some of the mentors that I've had over the last 25 years are at the pinnacle of their game, and, and I'm very fortunate that I've been uh, mentored and coached by six very successful CEOs, uh, very successful uh, personal fitness um, instructors, um, uh, preachers, and uh, pastors, and um, coaches. 
And I'm going to share with you some, some things today that they shared with me that I've learned on, over the last 25 years that I think that really help make me successful and make me who I am. And um, there's four things that really make me successful. Is the first thing you have to have a vision. The second thing, there's no substitute for hard work. And, and I'm going to touch on each one of these subjects and, and go into a little bit more detail. A positive attitude is so, 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 so important. Um, and I, I think a lot of people don't understand the power of positivity and, uh, and being able to persevere, being able to overcome obstacles, and, and be able to process things as they happen. I touched on this one earlier with my rule of five, and some of these are my rule of five also because I incorporated those into, into what I've learned, um, building value in other people. Um, when you become more focused on other people than you are yourself and build value in other people, um, you get a momentum that is very, very hard to stop because you surround yourself with people that want to see you succeed because when you succeed, they succeed. So <clears throat> first thing is um, having a vision. It's so, so important to have a vision and have a goal. There's, there's very few people, and, and I think it's less than 10% of the population, has a vision, has a goal that has been written down and shared with others that can help them accomplish it. And what happens sometimes when they share it with others, not everybody wants to, wants to see you succeed. Some people are jealous. Some people may not think that you can do it. Some people may, may be naysayers and say, you know what, that's been done before and it didn't work. That's not going to work. So you're going to face those uh, challenges. You're also, um, when you have a goal you, and it goes to working hard, you have to take massive action. And you have to be very relentless and disciplined in that action. And you have to see it before you can achieve it. And so I'm going to get everybody to stand up real fast. We're going to do a little exercise. I want everybody to put your hand out in front of you and be, be, be cognizant of your neighbor and reach back as far as you can. All right. I put your hand back in front of you. I want you to close your eyes. And I don't want you to move your arm, but I want you to visualize you reaching back as far as you can and going all the way to the middle of your back. Visualize it, don't do it. All right, bring your arm visually back in front of you like it is now. Let's go one more time. Visualize your arm going back all the way almost to your other shoulder. Now bring it back. Now this is the last time, I want you to visualize your arm going all the way back and it circles all the way around your body just like an owl's head. All right, visualize that. All right, now open your eyes. All right, now let's, everyone now that we did that, put your arm back as far as you can. <laughs> what just happened? What just happened? All right, you can have a seat. <clears throat> I, to go I told everybody to reach back as far as you can, and I saw this, and I saw this, and I saw this, but just now I saw this. I saw it almost wrapping around. Almost every one of you that I looked at reached around further that last time than you did the first time I asked you to reach as far as you could. What do you think just happened? You visualized it. You saw yourself do it. You saw it visualized. Um, you know, a friend of mine, he was um, he was going for a position, he was working on a position, and it wasn't about the title, it wasn't about the money, it was about the thought that he could contribute at a higher level. He thought he could make more of a difference in his organization. So you know what he did? He went and had business cards made with that title on it, and he set them on his bedside table, and every night before he went to bed, he looked at that. And he had that vision that he was going to get in that position. And he had, he had written it down. He had shared it with his boss. He had shared it with his peers. He had shared it with, his, uh, with, with people that reported to him. And you know what? Within six months after him making those business cards, guess what? He started using them because he got that position. He visualized it. And so the power of having a vision and the power of having a goal and to writing that down and sharing it with people, not listening to people saying you can't do it or it's never been done before, um, it is very, very important. <clears throat> The people who achieve their goals or their visions are simply the ones that refuse to give up. And they're willing to put in the work. So if you can visualize it and you want it bad enough and you're willing to put in the work, print those business cards. You know, let people know what your goals are. Let them, and, and when I do that with my group every year, my annual goals, my, my inner circle, I, I hand them to them. They have my goals for this, this year as this is my goals personally, this is my goals professionally. 
And they asked me about them. Hey, what are you doing to accomplish this? What are you doing? Where are you at? You know, we hold each other accountable. And uh, if you don't have an inner circle that does that, I suggest you get one um, because it is a very special thing. Don't let someone else's opinion of you become your reality. Like I said, the naysayers. You know, sometimes it's people closest to you. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your parents. No, don't do that. Don't jump out there and do that. You know, you may fail. But you may fail. What if you do fail? You know, what's wrong with that? And I'll tell you a little more about it. Uh, you know, you know who failed? Um, he failed. You know how many how many banks he went to before someone loaned him money? He went to three hundred and two banks. Three hundred and two banks, and the three hundred third bank believed in him, and they lent him the money. And look where his organization is today. How many of us? How many of us would knock on three hundred and two doors and keep knocking? How many of us would keep persevering and keep pushing forward after 302 people said, no, not going to work, you're crazy, that vision will never work, nobody will, go to the, nobody will be attracted to that. And now look where he is now. But it took this. It took that. It takes hard work. And it takes, it all begins with hard work. And to me, you know, I have the opportunity to mentor, you know, some, some, I, one of the, the guys I have an opportunity to visit with is in here today, uh, wanting to develop his career. He's on a great path. He has a vision. He has a goal. He knows where he wants to go. But they'll ask, what's, what's the secret to success? The secret to success, there's no secret. The secret to success, there's no silver bullet. The secret to success is you have to be very disciplined. You have to be very focused. You have to have a vision. And people have to know you for one thing and one thing first, and it's your grind. It's your grit. You know, they, they, they know that you're going to work, you're going to push, you're going to press forward. And uh, before they know you for anything else, for your title, for your position, for your degree, um, for your education, they need to know that you're willing to grind. And you cannot replace grind or grit uh, with anything. So um, relentless self-discipline. And um, not take anything for granted. You know, no matter how good you are, if you ever think that you've arrived and you think that you're at the pinnacle and you're at the top of your game, you're done because there's somebody that's about to knock you off that mountain. So you have never arrived. If you ever think that you've arrived and that you can slow down or work less, you might as well be ready to, uh, to, to not be where you are or not continue to grow at that level. This is a really good one. I, I like this one. Um, Tiger Woods, this guy, 21 years old. Entered his first Masters, and he won it. Not only did he win his first Masters in 19, 1997 at 21 years old, he won it by a record-breaking 12 strokes. And it was within months, I believe, of him entering the circuit. So media comes out, and they're like, this is an overnight sensation. This is Tiger Woods. He came out and won the Masters and beat all the best in the world. He's an overnight sensation. He was not an overnight sensation. Tiger Woods' dad had a golf club in his hand at five years old. He had to go out there hours a day, every day of the week, since he was five years old, swinging that golf club and getting better and better and better. He put in the work, but people don't see that. You know, people don't see. They just see he comes from nowhere. He enters and he wins the Masters. The neat thing about Tiger Woods is he, he gets this. And so he, he basically said, no matter how good you are, you can always be better. He just won the Masters. He made that statement after he won the Masters. And he said, that's what's really exciting because I'm, no, I'm, I'm not as good as I'm going to be. And he still has that same attitude. What Tiger Woods did is he hired a coach. He, he, he hired a, a coach. He hired a therapist. He hired a masseuse. And he started spending a lot of his earnings on personal development. And what one of his instructors figured out that if Tiger, when he was swinging that club, if he made a two millimeter adjustment, he said, you know, you're, you're doing great, but if, and he just won the Masters, make a two millimeter adjustment, and you're gonna go from great to outstanding. And he made that adjustment, and he was a better golfer than he was when he won the, when he won the, uh, the Masters. My point behind that, and I call it the two millimeter rule, sometimes we're only two millimeters away from breakthrough. And I can't tell you how many times that I've seen somebody quit or give up or leave the company and they were going to have that next promotion. They were going to be the next in line and something uh, right after they left, something happened and, and they didn't have that opportunity. Two millimeters is the difference between me being slunched down up here like this or with me with my head held high and my chest out with confidence. You know, two millimeters, that two millimeters is the difference and it does not take much of adjustment 
to go from, from good or great to outstanding. So it takes work. It takes hard work. There's no substitute for hard work. Thomas Edison said this. What did Thomas Edison do? Gave us a light bulb. Thomas Edison fell a thousand times before he finally hit the invention of the light bulb. Um, he was interviewed and said, Thomas, how did it feel to fail a thousand times? And he said, I didn't fail. He said, it took a thousand steps to, to create this light bulb. It took a thousand steps to create this light bulb. Every time, this, every time it didn't work, it gave me the opportunity to try something else better. And um, what if he wouldn't have pushed through? What if he wouldn't have persevered? What if he wouldn't have pressed forward with that? Um, would we have the light bulb today? Probably so, but maybe it would have came 100 years later. Maybe it would have came you know, through different technology. It may have not have been as good or as, 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 as easy to adapt or evolve. But my point behind that is, if you want to say you failed, say you failed. But sometimes that's a lesson that we learn and either we can win or we can learn. It's all a matter of perspective. You know, if you want, if you want to call it failing, um, I think it's going to give you a different perspective on what you're trying to accomplish. And if you feel like you failed, would you want to continue to try? But if you feel like you learned the lesson and it made you better, would you continue to try? So, just like this guy. You know, the guy that invented the ship, he also invented the shipwreck. <laughs> <laughs> Building values and others. Um, th this is one that I'm very passionate about. I talked to, a, I touched on it some already. Uh, visited with you some about it already. And, and this is this is a good one for me because I think that uh, whenever you build value in others, you treat people the way you want to be treated, you treat people with respect, and you try to lift them up that um, and, and make them better, um, it makes a huge difference. You know, I try to surround myself with people that champion me, that care about me, that want to make me better, and I try to do the same for them. Um, I always try to bring more value to them than they bring to me. And uh, that's always a goal. You invest in people, I talked about investing in people earlier. Uh, mentors and advisors, um, helping others get what they want and they'll help you get what you want. And also, um, and the young man I was referring to earlier, that young man, and I'm a compliment him, Isaac's here today. Um, Isaac is, is very um, inspirational for me. Um, he's very motivated, he's very smart, and he's gonna be very, very successful um, in what he does. Um, he got, up, he got online and started um, emailing these investment bankers and just asking them, you know, random investment bankers, hey, I'd like to do some time with you, I'd like to do some time with you. And they were successful. And finally, one of them responded, said, sure, you know, I'll give you some time. And uh, he was able to do a Zoom call with a financial advisor in, uh, in Houston just by cold calling and asking him a list of questions. He reached out to, to me, he reached out to Blake, he reached out to, to Trey Henderson and did the same. He was like, hey, I'd like to know, you know, let's talk about success. You know, what can I do right now to help position myself to be more successful in the future? Um, look at people that are successful in what they do or successful in what you do and ask them what books they're reading. Ask them how they're being mentored. Ask them how they're being coached. Um, you can't do it on your own. You have to have people around you, but in turn, you have to build value in others when people are building value in you. You gotta give back. So it's about contribution as well. You will become who you spend time with. So this is the, the law of the inner circle. Um, you have to be very, very, very careful in who you spend your time with. And I can't tell you how many family members, how many acquaintances that I have had to disassociate myself because they're negative. Um, they're always making excuses. They're, they're looking for something that's gonna benefit you without any reciprocity of benefit and, um, um, that are benefiting them without benefiting you. So you are who you spend time with. <clears throat> and I'm gonna give you an example of this. This was a physics conference in 1927 in Solvay. Out of the 20 men here, um, you may recognize this one right here, that wild hair, y'all recognize that man? After this conference, 17 of these scientists, 17 won the Nobel Prize, 17. They weren't at this conference together because they won the Nobel Prize. They won the Nobel Prize because that's their inner circle. And they're working together and they're figuring it out and they're building value in each other. Um, and, and that's the power of the inner circle. Surround yourself with people, and this is Warren Buffett, surround yourself with people that push you to be better and to do better 
that no drama, no negativity, just higher goals and higher motivation, good times and positive energy, no jealousy or hate, simply bring out the absolute best in each other. And that's one of our rules uh, in our inner circle. That's a rule for us. You know, there's no jealousy, there's no hate. If you, if you win, I am proud of you. If you hit a big one, I'm proud of you. If you get promoted, I'm proud of you. Not everybody's that way. Um, some people, there's haters, guys. There's haters. And when you succeed and you prosper and you do well, they want to criticize or they want to, to uh, make an excuse or, or come up with some justification of why you did that. Get those people out of your life. If they don't build value in you, if the people in my inner circle don't build value in me, I'm not going to associate with them, period. I'm not going to have drama. I'm not going to have negativity. I'm just not going to associate with them, man. And we have that ability to disconnect ourselves from people that don't build us up. This is one that really sticks with me, and it is so, so true. And I'm not talking about your net worth financially. I'm not talking about your net worth monetarily. I'm talking about your personal net worth. Your net worth is going to determine your net worth. So be very, very, very diligent and careful of who you decide to surround yourself with. Surround people that are going to talk about visions and ideas and not other people. When you're around somebody and they're talking about other people, and they're rumoring and gossiping, <clears throat> psychologists prove that your brain automatically associates those negative comments to them. And they, you automatically lose trust in them. Because if they're going to say that to you about somebody else, what are they saying to them about you? And so be very careful who, um, who you surround yourself with because that's going to determine um, your moods, your attitudes, your behaviors, and, uh, and, and who, um, who's in your corner. So I'm going to talk about one that I'm very, very passionate about. So positive attitude and gratitude. You know, I can, I can do a presentation just on this alone. The golden rule of leadership of life in every country in the world, it, it, biblically, biblically you can go back there is some form of the golden rule, basically saying, do it to others as you have them do it to you. Um, and, and I quoted the, the Bible verse uh, there, um, attitude's a choice, and you're in control of your own attitude. You're in control of your own emotions. And, and I'm going to give you um, some examples of that here in a minute. Taking ownership and not making excuses, coming up with solutions. Being an influencer, um, having a spirit of excellence, a spirit of excellence to me. Do you walk by and pick up a piece of trash and you walk past it? Do you walk by and see something needs to be done and you don't do it and you think you're waiting for somebody else to do it or do you do it? That spirit of excellence, um, what you do when nobody's looking. What you do, especially when nobody's looking. It's called character. And, uh, and physical and mental vitality, I think, go hand in hand. Uh, we talked about earlier laughing about waking up and working out early. A couple of my district managers are here. Um, they oversee uh, multiple units, and you know they wake, wake up every morning early and they work out. And, and both of them, I met with them recently. They said, you know, since I've started this routine, I'm not stressed. I have a clearer mind. I have a clearer head. I have a better attitude. I feel better. I'm more confident. I'm more productive. And so mental and physical vitality in, in your family life and leading your family and leading a church and leading an organization and leading a nonprofit is critical. Um, if you don't feel good, you're not going to perform. And so you have to make sure you take care of your physical vitality in turn. Uh, you take care of your mental vitality, overcoming obstacles and adversities. And um, a mentor of mine told me this. He said, uh, you know, when things happen, I look at it from a different perspective. I look at it as life happens for me or that happened for me and not to me. And um, so which brings me to this. Life is 10% of what happens to us and 90% of how we respond. So I was um, communicating this to somebody about a year ago, and they said, well, yeah, that's easy for you to say. You know, you don't know who my spouse is. You don't know who I'm married to. You don't know who my mom and dad is. You don't know my children are heathens. That's easy for you to say. And, uh, and, and they're right, it is. You know, you don't know my situation. You don't know what I've been through. So you're right, I don't. But what I will tell you, Whenever you go through something and you try to maintain positivity and you try to uh, realize that you're in control of your emotions, you're going to do that a little better, right? And so um, I told you I was going to speak to you from the heart, speak to you from the gut. So in uh, 2016, I was in the process of transitioning to Lufkin to, to, to oversee operations for Berkshire Brothers. I've been with them for you know over 20 years at that point. <laughs> 
and it was December 22nd. It was right before Christmas, and the grocery business Christmas is very busy, so I get out and was making stores. Hadn't moved to Lufkin yet, driving from Huntsville to Lufkin. Seven o'clock in the morning, um, my wife starts calling me. And, um, and I was on the phone with one of my district managers, and I, I declined it. She called back, I declined it, and she sent me a text. She said, answer your phone. So I pull over, uh, I answer my phone, she said, are you driving? I said, yeah, I'm passing through Lufkin right now, I'm the neck of the She's pull over on the side of the road. And I'm like, what? She's like, pull over on the side of the road. And I'm like, why? She's like, just pull over on the side of the road. So I pulled over and she said two things. Um, she said, Gucci died last night. And she said, and your dad just called me and your mom died this morning. And um, I lost my dog and my mom the same day. And, um, you know, I didn't know that she was talking to me. And I'm like, dude, what? I'm like, who are you talking to? My mom was 59 years old in perfect health, health, fell asleep on the couch. My dad woke up, made coffee, went to wake her up, and she was cold. Um, she was a very important part of my life. She was a very important part of my family's life, and she was the most positive person I'd ever met. Um, and so I went to a dark place, and that was very difficult for me because I wasn't expecting it. None of us were expecting it. Um, we had just had our first grandbaby. And she, you know, we were looking at houses uh, in Lufkin, and we were actually looking at you know a, a place where she would have her own space so she could come down. She was getting ready to retire. She went back to school later on in life and became a registered nurse with you know with uh, small children. And, and I've always had a lot of respect for. Her. I went to a dark place. And I was pissed off and I was angry and I was resentful. And um, you know, I was having problems processing it. And then one day I was thinking, I was like, Is this what she would want for me? You know, is this what she would want for me? Um, to be mad and angry, questioning God and questioning the universe. Why us? Why this happened to us? And so, I, I, you know, I'm always positive. I'm talking about, you know, pushing through and being positive. And now is a perfect time for me to walk the talk and to suck it up and to process it and to grieve and to move on. And, and that's what I did. And, and, um, and it was a pretty quick process, honestly. It really was because I knew that she went to, I knew where she went. And I knew that she was in a better place where she went. Um, and I knew she took Gucci with her because she loved dogs. <laughs> that made me feel better too because I knew they were together. Um, <clears throat> what I'm telling you is that adversities are going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. Don't let a season of mourning turn into a lifetime of mourning that affects everyone around you. When I was laying in that bed and I was sulking and I was in self-pity, you know what? I thought about my daughter. I'm like, you know, look what look what she's doing. Look what she's having to see. And that's what opened my eyes. And that, you know, the support system that brought me up and prayed for me and helped me and encouraged me, uh, that's what got us through that. And pretty quick, I was, you know, back on my feet and back positive and back happy and looking at the things that we did have. You know, we, we still had a lot to be grateful for. So um, a year later, um, I got promoted. We moved to Lufkin. Um, we, uh, we, we found a dream home in uh, Westwood Bend, uh, got a dream home, uh, and had another baby. So we found out a month after my mom died, we were pregnant with another little girl, and we weren't supposed to have kids. So uh, we were blessed with another little girl. She looks just like my mom. She acts like my mom. Um, and uh, and uh, I think mom sent her to us. And um, I was working out every day. I was in the best physical shape of my life. I was in the best mental shape of my life. Things were good for us. Um, and... You know, I just got a, a, an outstanding promotion with an outstanding company, working for a great leader. Uh, John Austin, CEO and president of Berkshire Brothers, is one of the smartest, uh, most intelligent, and most visionary men that I've ever met. I've had the opportunity to be mentored under him for over 17 years now. And so I kind of realized, sometimes when we're in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but actually you've been planted. And you come out stronger, and you come out better. And, you, and, and, and I think attitude has a lot to do with that, right? Moved to Lufkin, things were great. I mean, on top of my game, everything was going well. Um, we were having a, a, a party at our house, and um, uh, we uh, it was Labor Day and my daughter's birthday, so we're going to throw a birthday party. I was up on a ladder about six foot high, got in a waltz nest, and bam. I fell off the ladder and crushed um, my entire foot. And, um, you know, went to the doctor just to say, hey, wrap it up. I, I know it's not broken. And he looks at the and he says, oh, my God. 
And that's not what you want to hear when you're sitting on the x-ray table. <laughs> they told me that um, the, the type of break this was, um, that I probably would never recover fully. Um, I probably wouldn't be you know, doing some of the things that I'm doing in the gym and athletically, and, and I was very active and they knew that. Um, so I had surgery. He said, I'll probably be um, out on crutches for 12 weeks. Um, eight weeks after surgery, I put a shoe on, I walked into Fit Life, and I worked out for the first time. Um, because I pushed myself, because I was not going to let what the doctor said become my reality. And, you know, I did therapy. I didn't do what I wasn't supposed to do. And he basically said, you can't screw it up. And I was like, if you tell me I can't screw it up, I'm about to push. And I'm going to go hard. And if I can't screw it up, I'm going to the gym. I realized, you know, sometimes you have to get knocked down um, lower than you've ever been before to build yourself back up. Right? So, <clears throat> I was still on crutches and uh, was in the recovery process and some events that transpired in my life where my marriage came to an abrupt end. Marriage of 16 years, married my high school sweetheart, um, came to an abrupt end. And, um, and there were some things out there and I heard, I wonder how Mr. Possum's gonna deal with this. You know, let's see how he does this. There's been people that never recover from this and I was with one of my friends and you know, he was telling me his father-in-law was complaining, yeah, I used to have a house and I used to own my business and I used to have this, but when, when your wife's mom left me, that ruined everything. My buddy was like, how long ago was that? 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> what? How long were you married? We were married 10 years. Like, what are you talking about, right? Like, that became his reality. And I was in self-pity. I'm laying in the bed and not wanting to get up and, you know, feel it, you know feeling sorry for myself. Oh, this happened. Um, but then I realized it was affecting my two little girls. And then I said, you know what? What would mom think about me right now? Laying in the bed crying and, and you know, mourning and grieving and drinking the, the, all this poison, poisoning myself. And you know what? I, I made a commitment and I turned it over to God. I let God take the will and I said, you know what? It is what it is. I've recovered from a lot of stuff. I am positive. I am going to push forward. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to push. I'm going to grind. And I will be blessed better than I ever have before. Um, and I'm telling you, throughout all that, I'm living the best life right now I've ever lived. And I've always been happy and I've always been positive. But you know what I think about? I think about the two billion people on this planet that are starving to death. I think about the two billion people on this planet that are living on less than $2 a day. There's people sleeping on, on, on dirt floors, 10 and 12 deep, in these little villages that don't have food to eat. And I'm worried, oh, I sold my house. I lost my side by side. You know, my retirement got cut in half. Who cares? You know what I have? I have my health. I have my friends. I have my inner circle. And I tell you, the day all this happened, I had an entourage show up at my, my house. And they walk in, and the five or six guys walk in and says, what do we need to take out of the house? No, they didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> they come in, and they said, what can we do for you? Let us pray for you. Let us help you. Let us lift you up. You know what? We have you. Um, one of them said, move into my pool house. You know, and, and he was friends with one of my other friends. He really didn't even know. He said, move into my pool house. He said, well, we're going to take care of you. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about the girls. Don't worry about school. Don't worry about daycare. And my friend stepped up, and I realized how much gratitude I have because we have clean water. We have friends. We have people that love us. We have people that care about us. So the reason I say all of this, bad things are going to happen. Adversity is going to happen. Disappointment, heartbreak, death, divorce, those things we don't want, but they're going to happen. And how we respond to that, how we deal with that, how we overcome that, and how we process that, it's up to us. It is up to us. And, you know, I was telling them the other day, we we're talking about what our strengths are. So I have a superpower. I can process things, and I can process it, I can deal with it, and I can move forward very, very quickly. I can change my state in 90 seconds, and I do some other things that's kind of crazy. I'm like, yes, 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 and I'm like, in a different level. Right? I'm not, how can you do that and not be, you know, happy and pumped up and motivated? Um, these are my little girls. Um, this was Halloween. Um, you know, they live with me now, and, um, and things are awesome. Um, this was us at the train station uh, celebrating the zoo for Halloween. Uh, my daughter voted at St. Cyprian's and I voted and you know we were celebrating our vote together and uh, going to, to farm days and going to birthday parties and living our best life ever. And these little girls are 
happier than I've ever seen be. And when all this happened, I was looking into what's going to happen, what's, what's the future hold. I was so consumed about the future that I wasn't looking at one step at a time. I wasn't looking at the present. I wasn't looking at the great people around me and the things around me. So my point behind this is don't turn a season of mourning, of sorrow, into a lifetime of mourning. This is something that kind of puts things in perspective for you also. Um, this is a quick exercise. It's a quick, short video that I share with my team um, that kind of breaks down how we spend our time, how, how we spend our days, how we spend our life. These are roughly 28,835 jelly beans. I counted out 500 of them and used those to weigh the rest. In this pile, there's one jelly bean for each day that the average American will live. You might have more beans in your life, or maybe less, but on average, this is the time we have. Here's a single bean. It's your very first day. A special day, but kind of a rough day on everyone involved. Add 364 more and you have the first year of your life. Now, for a sense of scale, here are your first 15 years, 5,475 days, which brings us to the threshold of adulthood. And at that moment, this is the time that we have left. And this is, on average, what we will do with all that time. We will be asleep for a total of 8,477 days. If we're lucky, some of that time we'll be sleeping next to someone we love. We will be in the process of eating, drinking, or preparing food for 1,635 days. We'll be at work, hopefully doing something satisfying, for the equivalent of 3,202 of those days. 1,099 days will be spent commuting or traveling from one place to another. Maybe a little bit more if you live in L.A. On average, we will watch television in one form or another for a total of 2,676 days. Household activities, like chores and tending to our pets and shopping, will take another 1,576 days. And we will care for the needs and well-being of others, our friends and family, for 564 days. We'll spend 671 days bathing, grooming, and doing all other bathroom-related activities. And another 720 days will go to community activities, like religious and civic duties, charities, and taking classes. After we remove all those beans, this is what remains. This is the time that we have left. Time for laughing, swimming, making art, going on hikes, text messages, reading, checking Facebook, playing softball, maybe even teaching yourself how to play the guitar. So what are you gonna do with this time? How much of it do you think you've already used up? If you only had half of it, what would you do differently? What about half of that? How much time have you already spent worrying instead of doing something that you love. What if you just had one more day? What are you gonna do today?